on Academy. Let's crack it. Good evening, everybody in India, and welcome to Leading by Example. This is going to be a fascinating chat. It really is going to be a fascinating chat. It's a, it's a chat that I've never ever really had with John Terry before. It's a chat that uh, um, I've spent plenty of time with him, but we've never really delved deep into the psychology around why he was such a great leader, why he was capable and able to take Chelsea, my favourite club in England, to so many Premiership titles. And he wore the armband for Chelsea for a number of years. He wore the armband for England for a number of years. And uh, it's going to be very, very intriguing too. And I think we have the big guy with us now. How are you, buddy? Hey, P, how you doing? I'm very good. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, Unacademy. Let's crack it. Absolute pleasure. How you got into um, the great sport that uh, you've been able to play and love for so long? Firstly, Kev, it's a, it's a pleasure to be, to be speaking to yourself and obviously everyone there. We have to convert all the uh, cricket players into Chelsea fans. We can't have them be a Man United and Liverpool supporters. Yes, so. now, yes. now that we're out of the way, uh, we'll get a few Chelsea shirts over and get that sorted, no problem. Beautiful. But my, my kind of love of, of football started from an early age, to be honest. My dad was, um, was a potential player. He had a, a good upbringing. He had trials at West Ham, um, declined decided to go out with his mates and enjoy kind of the life a little bit um, and then he got me and my brother into football from the age of two and three really and we always had a ball at our feet from any any kind of baby photos growing up and and that's how it started really that was the, the start of the journey and what about positions uh, you've obviously been unbelievable in the success that you've had in, in, in defense were you always a defender? You say, this is where I want to start, because I know with my little lad, Dylan, he just wants to strike all the time, he just wants to kick balls in, and it must be quite difficult at a young age to decide, I want to be a defender, or did you say, no, I want to be a striker, and you ended up in defence? Yeah, well, firstly, no one wants to be defenders anymore. No, they? no. The attackers throwing the goals, getting the headlines, all of that, but I originally started as a midfielder. So when I was at Chelsea, when I first got scouted for Chelsea, West Ham, Arsenal, Man United, I was a, a midfield player, um, regarded as kind of one of the best in the area, along with many other players, Scott Parker being one at the time as well. Lance. And, and kind of being touted about, but I kind of started there, then I obviously signed my contract at Chelsea. And when I first got into the youth team at Chelsea at 16, um, I didn't make the team. So I was on the bench for the first couple of games. And then all of a sudden, before one game, we had two defenders in the warm-up. One was sick and one got an injury in the warm-up. So the, the youth team manager said to me, do I want to play centre-back? Centre and I was like, I'll play anywhere. I'll play in goal. I just want to play football. Yeah. You know, so I went there. We beat Derby 4-1. I scored two goals from set pieces, from corners. I had an outstanding game. And literally, Kev, from that moment, I never went back into midfield. Wow. Um, so it was a kind of turning point in, in my career, for sure. A little bit of stroke of luck as well. but. I was ready and willing to go and play anywhere and then I ended up spending my career and I think because I was a midfield player as well, I, I had good vision, I could see the game well. I think the further I went back, so now I'm a defender, now I've got the whole game in front of me. So I was never the quickest, never the strongest, but intelligence wise, I felt like I was one step or two steps ahead of, of the other players. So always put myself in good positions to be to be able to be a, a very good centre back. What was the, what was the, I'd say, the worst part of your career growing up? How, what Was it that phase between 14 and 16? Did you doubt yourself? Because a lot of youngsters do doubt themselves. And how were you able to press on? Yeah, I think at times, like my dad was quite, so like after games at the age of 14, 15, I'd gone from being kind of the big star locally and probably in the UK to now kind of, like I say, getting pushed off the ball, not scoring as many goals not winning enough tackles, not winning enough headers anymore. And my dad being quite ruthless with me, sitting next to my dad in, on the car going, you're rubbish, you've lost it. So that mental kind of toughness, it was like, uh, you know what, I'm not having this. I'm not having my dad talk to me like that. Uh, my brother was two years older than me. So I, I went, I started to, to go and play with his friends. So his friends were like two years older than me, but physically four or five years older than me and they would push me off the ball, but I, I just had to find a way of being more physical, more aggressive, or finding three or four different ways 
of kind of competing with the likes of them. So could I make a foul to break the play up? So I, I think I kind of went away. I assessed my, my game and went away, even at a young age, thinking, how can I get better? Not just accepting that I was smaller, I was slimmer, I wasn't as strong as others, going, I'm not having this, I need to find a way. And I did, I managed to find a way and managed to get through games a little bit, but it, it was tough. You, you need to be mentally strong, but throughout my career, and I think we'll come to that later on, that inspired me when people doubted me in my career, whether that be individuals or supporters or players from another team, it yeah. just inspired me to, to go and push even more for that success. How professional was football back then? Back in uh, the days when you were making it, when you signed your first junior contract, when you were making your way up into into the Chelsea team, how professional was it compared to today? Compared to what it is today, black and white, completely, complete opposites. And we look at the nutrition side of the game now, not just in football, but the world of sport as well. Yeah. So we finished training, we'd go upstairs, we'd have burger and chips or sausage and mash and little bits like that. It was kind of a, a couple of ladies who lived close to the training ground that would cook the food. There was no nutrition aspect towards it. You know, you'd finish training, go straight home, you'd be home by 12, 30, 1 o'clock. Yeah. The, uh, we was lucky at Chelsea because we signed the likes of Gianfranco Zola, Ruud Hullet, Luca Viali, and they turned up at the training ground going, like, where's the food? Where's the pasta? Where's the carbohydrates? Where's the protein? We need a bigger oh. gym. We need to stretch. And they took it to another level. And I was really lucky at that, at that stage of 16 to be in an environment and around these players. Wow. And also close to them, Kev, as well. So as a 16, 17-year-old, you're cleaning players' boots, you're making them coffees, you're cleaning toilets. So you're doing all that, but you can't help but pick up little bits. So Franco, for an example, he would get in two hours before everyone else. He'd go in the gym, do a weight session. He'd do, he'd stretch for two hours after training. He'd have a massage, he'd relax, he'd eat the right food. And it was just like, wow. For okay. years, like finish training, go down the pub. That was what I kind of grew up in. And then these guys took it to a completely new level. And it's probably gone on another five, six levels from, from then what we are today. Do you value the team success uh, as part of just an individual play within the team? Uh, well, the team success is there for me. It's like, it's what you work and, and live for, really. I think you only get the individual honours if you're performing as a team. So I look at every kind of indi individual honour that I won, and I genuinely, I couldn't have done it without the players around me. Mm. So it, it's not just me being in the right position, it's my left back, Ashley Cole, being in the right position, helping me as a centre back. It's about McAuley being just in front of me that I get protected a little bit. It's about Frank working box to box. So again, there's some unbelievable individual honours there for me, but I always look at those collective and those team ones and those memories that you're never going to get again, you're never going to replicate. And those moments before the game, after the game, the celebrations that come with that are just, you know, memories for a lifetime. Why is it that it's so difficult for England to perform at big tournaments? What is, what is the issue? Is, it, is there so much rivalry between, uh, and I know how much rivalry there is because I'm mates with quite a few of you, and yeah. it's difficult. How can you, I mean, it's, it's hard for me. I mean, how can you play Man United versus Chelsea on a Sunday night, Sunday night football? You are going hell for leather. Or say Liverpool versus you guys. Lampard mm. and Gerrard trying to kill each other to win this game. And then on a Monday morning, they're going to turn up at the road, up the road here at uh, um, Stoke or Stoke Park or where it was. Hey, good morning. I mean, uh, how are you, mate? Everything fine? I mean, the headlines are blowing up while you guys are trying to say hello to each other. It was difficult and it's obviously the big question mark, isn't it, over the years that we we look back and go, how did we not win anything with the team we had back in 2004, 6, 2, 8, 2, 10, all yeah. of them. So it, it's a tough question. I, f I think my only answer on that would be that, like I said before, we're with each other on a with Chelsea or Man United on a daily basis for 3, 20, 3, 30 days of the year. With England, you get 10 days if you're lucky to yeah. kind of Practically, by the time you kind of get used to each other and you find your feet a little bit within that group, it's time to go back to your clubs. But the, the one thing that kind of always disappointed me was those kind of tournaments. And it was, and, and the FA was a little bit reluctant, Kev, on this as well, because as, as a group of players, on a Monday to Friday, you don't need to tell John Terry what to do. Because if I want to play golf on the Tuesday or the Wednesday, and I've got a game on the Saturday, I know exactly what works for me and my body. 
So yeah. now you go into a different environment where they go, you can't play golf, you can't go to the cinema, you can't go for a coffee, and you're in this little room, probably like you guys get, you're in a, you're in a hotel room from like one o'clock till seven o'clock thinking I've got dinner in six hours. Yeah. And then, you know, then you have a massage, then you go to bed and you just repeat the same stuff over and over again. Mm -hmm. I, would have liked, I would have liked to have taken responsibility of going, I know what works for me on a daily basis. So if the lads want to play golf or want to go out of our kind of environment, yeah. for a shot, you know, just to stretch your legs and see people and, and yeah. be normal, you know, let us do it and trust us. But we never kind of got that balance. I think it's different now under Southgate. Everything I hear about Southgate is incredible. The way he involves the players, he gives them a voice, he lets them lead a lot of the, the training, the meetings, really makes them inclusive in that. And I think that's a big part of it, especially with the new generation, how they are. Not at all. Your last 26 minutes in uh, Jersey number 26, that was, I mean, I remember watching it, that was proper emotion. Yeah, it was, I didn't play that season because obviously Conte come in, we went to a three at the back. Um, and it, I was kind of coming towards the end of my career as well, but we kind of won the league, which is fantastic for me because I've got to get the send off that that I always wanted. If I was ever to leave Chelsea, I wanted to have a proper send off, and I definitely got that. Yeah. And Antonio was brilliant with me. Gaz Kale was excellent because we had a final two weeks time after that game. So I said, Antonio, listen, because he was like, you have to play. It's your last game at home in front of the fans. I was like listen, no chance, right? The most important thing is the final, nothing will ever be bigger than the club, that kind of thing. And we kind of come to an agreement that why don't I play 26 minutes and come off, which means Gaz Kale can keep his rhythm for the final and that kind of thing. So ended up 26 minutes, I'd spoken to the captain of Sunderland at the time. So as a captain, you go in and meet the referees before the game. And I was like, listen, this is a bit of a strange art rule. But on 26 minutes, if you've got the ball, get your players to kick it out of play because I'm coming off. Our players knew the same, they were. So 25 minutes, I'm looking up at the clock thinking, <laughs> and it went to the keeper and it must have just ticked over and he kicked it out of play and I was like, thank God for that. You know, 26 minutes was a kind of special lucky number for me at Chelsea. And um, to go off after 26 minutes is uh, very sentimental, but a good way to go. Decision that you regret making? Should you have gone, gone, gone and Gone, gone off to Villa and stuff or? No, it would be, it, it's the one that gets me actually, is the retiring from England. He's, he's my biggest one. I've, I've never said that publicly either, to be honest, but obviously there was there was a bit of drama around it and yeah. stuff. And I just yeah. felt I've had a, a, a kind of relationship with the FA over the years where, you know, we're very, very honest with each other, but I really felt they let me down at the time. And that, that was my instinct to do that. I think I went and played later on in my career because I was getting a rest. So at any time there was an international break from the point I retired, I kind of asked the manager for three, four days off because I wanted to go and recharge and make sure that I was ready for Chelsea Football Club. So from that side of it, I think the longevity would give me a couple more years for sure. But I just wish I would have got 100 caps. I ended up finishing with 78 caps for England. And it's something that, you know, you, you learn, don't you? You know, you're never going to get that opportunity again. If I could, I'd, I'd, I'd take it back tomorrow and, and try my best to get to 100 caps. Buddy, you've been a legend. You are a legend. Uh, thank you so much. Have you ever been to India? Been there I yet? Haven't. I haven't. I would love to. So I'll be waiting for an invite and I'd love to come over. 100%. We'll get that done, mate. Thank you so much for being so open. Uh, you're and, welcome. And, uh, yeah, I wish you every success for um, for for your coaching career. I know you're trying to make it into the coaching world, um, and I think everybody watching this would like to thank you. And uh, I think you've been absolutely spectacular, buddy. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Kev. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Cheers, JT. Bye, bro. Bye, bye. Thank you.